Abraham experienced it and his name was changed. Sarah experienced it and she got laughter. Moses experienced it and he went from hiding to leading. David experienced it and became God's beloved. Elijah experienced it and brought down fire. A savior has come to you. A healer has come to you. A deliverer has come to you. A redeemer has come to you. You will not miss your miracle. Now, it's your time. Experience the supernatural in this month's Global Crusade themed The Glorious Visitation of Christ happening live in Ghana. God is ready to move. Also featuring our ministers, church workers and professional conference team enabling grace and power for the end time harvest. The youth aren't left behind as they are moving upward to higher heights with the Impact Academy. Join us from the 28th to 25th of April at Independence Square, Osu, Accra. The word of power would be broadcast worldwide through satellite, radio, TV, and the GCK social media platforms. We will be blessed by glorious music from choirs around the world. Praise the Lord. Church, if you are there, I said, praise the Lord. We're happy to be together tonight. And I'm so happy to see the newcomers and the invitees who are here in our midst. I welcome you all in Jesus' name. I pray this will not be your last time of coming. This is a Bible study session. And we're going to study the Bible together with you and with everyone else today in Jesus' name. We are transmitting the Bible study to many parts of the world. Nigeria, countries in Africa, and outside Africa. So I'll be catching your faces. I'll be showing your faces to the world. And um, so I want you to pay attention. Don't sleep. And if you have a Bible, you open the Bible. If you don't have, you will listen to the verses I'm quoting. And then I'll explain everything to you. We normally take a long time, longer than you expect. But tonight, we'll do our best to keep you awake. Will you stay awake? God bless you. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the Bible study. We thank you for our brothers and sisters. And we thank you for members and invitees who are here tonight. We're asking, Lord, that you explain your word in such a way that everybody will have something to take back home in Jesus' name. And we pray that you make us see Jesus, Jesus crucified, Jesus on the cross, Jesus our Savior and Jesus who has gone to heaven to prepare a place for us. And we pray that none of us will miss out in that great provision of Christ in Jesus' name. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. God bless you. You can see that tonight we are studying from John chapter 19. And I'm going to select some verses. Actually, we're studying from verse 23 all through to verse 42. But I'm going to select some verses to start with so that you understand what we are about to do tonight. Let me read from verse 23. It says, Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments, and they made four parts to every soldier a part, and also his coat. Now the coat was without seam, woven from the top throughout. There's a word there I want you to understand. I want you to pick up. is the word crucified. Look at verse 23. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus. So there's one word there, crucified. But as he was crucified, actually before he was crucified, he had to carry his own cross to the place of crucifixion. I'm reading now from verse 17. In verse 17, and he, bearing his cross, went forth into the place called the place of his call, which is called in the Hebrew Golgotha. So you find another word there, the cross. He bore his cross. 
He carried his cross and he got to the place where he was crucified. And then as he got to that place, it says, they crucified him. Look at verse 18. Where they crucified him and two others with him on either side, one and Jesus in the midst. So they crucified him. Look at verse 30. In verse 30, when Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. There's a word there you want to underline in your Bible. Finished. It is finished. And eventually in verse 34, it says, but one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side and forthwith came out their water and blood or blood and water tonight we're looking at the purpose and the provision of christ's crucifixion already i've read the verses to you and you know we're talking about the crucifixion of jesus christ on the cross at calvary as we study tonight but what's the purpose and why was he crucified What's the provision? What do you have? What do I have as a result of that crucifixion? There are many people that just tell the story of the crucifixion. Christ was crucified. Crucified on the cross. They mention Friday. They mention Saturday. They mention Sunday. Then he rose again. They know the story. They might even describe to you the pain and the agony that he went through. They might describe to you how the betrayal took place, the people that took him, the people that arrested him, and eventually he was nailed on the cross. And even the seven saints of the cross, there are people that can repeat that, but they do not understand what's the reason why. Why was he crucified? For what purpose was he crucified? And that's what we're looking at tonight, the purpose and the provision of Christ's crucifixion. Let me first of all say, we see him on the cross. Come to Matthew chapter 27. Matthew chapter 27. And I read here from verse 42. We see Christ now on the cross. And when he was on the cross, what did he say? The people that saw him there, how did they jeer at him? How did they mock him? How did they ridicule him? Look at this in verse 42, Matthew chapter 27. He saved others himself, he cannot save. They were making fun of him that he healed many people, he saved many people, he calmed the storm, and he solved their problems. Now he's on the cross, and he said himself, he cannot save. That's true, that's true. Because he had to die for you, he had to die for me. And if he saved himself, if he came down from the cross, you would not be saved. And because he counted your salvation as the priority, as the important thing, as the preeminent thing in his mind, that's why he didn't come down from the cross. In fact, they said, if he be the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross and we will believe him. Let him come down from the cross and we will believe him. Why didn't he respond to that? Because if he came down from the cross and they said they believed him, they couldn't be saved. There's no way anyone can be saved without Jesus Christ taking our place on the cross of Calvary. In verse 43, they said he trusted in God. Let him deliver him now if he will if he will have him for he said I am the son of God. Now we come to first Corinthians chapter one. We're looking at him on the cross. You must see him on the cross because if you don't see him on the cross, you cannot see him wearing the crown because the cross comes before the crown and you have to see him on the cross before you can see him wearing the crown you have to see him dying for you before you can see him making a place for you in heaven we we'll see him on the cross look at this in first corinthians chapter 1 verse 18 first corinthians chapter 1 verse 18 for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness but unto us which are saved it is the power of god he died on the cross so that through that cross and through that death and through that crucifixion the power of god will be channeled unto you 
man is weak. We have a lot of challenges and a lot of enemies. Satan is our enemy and there's nobody that can match Satan. Sin is our enemy and there's nobody that can match sin and say, by myself, I will defeat a sin. No, you cannot by yourself. And then there are, there's suffering in the world. Suffering is so much it can overwhelm you. But you know, the power that comes to us, we overcome sin, we overcome Satan, we overcome sickness, we overcome suffering. It comes through Jesus Christ. And there's only one way whereby that power will be transferred to you. It is by the power of the cross. Look at that verse 18 again. It says the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. The people that hear the story of the cross, they say, I don't understand that. I don't understand the wisdom in that. I don't understand how he took my place. I don't understand. And because they don't understand, it's foolishness to them. And if they count it as foolishness, and they say, I'm not a fool, I'm not going to believe that, they will perish. But thank God tonight, those who are here, you will not perish. Because you understand, it is this cross that is the power of God. I'm coming to Ephesians chapter 2. We're looking at Christ on the cross. You see him in your mind on the cross. And he died for you. And as you picture, imagine him on the cross dying for you. The power that lives a righteous life makes us to live righteous life. Welcome to every one of us in Jesus' name. Look at Ephesians chapter 2, and I'm reading from verse 14. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 14, for he is our peace, who has made both one, and he has broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished, look at that, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances for to make in himself of twain one new man so making peace. He'll make you a new man. A new woman. Your life will change. Your life will be transformed. But how? Look at this in verse 16. And he but and uh, and that he might reconcile both to God in one body by the cross. You see that he reconciles us to God, whether we're Jews or Gentiles. That's what it means by both there, both the Jew and the Gentile, both the white and the black, both those on the other side of the sea and on this side of the sea. He reconciles us to God by the cross. And then he says, having slain the enmity thereby, and he came and preached peace unto you, which were afar off, and to them which were near. Do you see two kinds of people there? The people that are far off, afar off in idolatry, afar off in paganism, afar off in heathenism, afar off as Gentiles, and the people who are very near, very near because they were Jews, very near because they were worshipping God, God, a little bit, but not totally acceptable. But those who are near, the Jews, and those who are far away, the Gentiles, he brings us to God and he reconciles us to God by his death on the cross of Calvary. Look at verse 18. For through him, through him, only through him, we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. If you're going to get to the Father, it is through that death that he died on the cross. And thank God you can come and you're welcome. Colossians chapter 2. In Colossians chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 13. Colossians chapter 2 verse 13. And you being dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, as he quickened together with him, having forgiven you, how many trespasses? All your trespasses. You will always carry guilt. Always carry condemnation. Except your forgiveness coming from Jesus. Coming from Christ. Because he died for you on the cross. Look at verse 14. Blotting out. The handwriting of ordinances that was against us. 
which was contrary to us, and he took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. That's the reason for the cross. All your condemnation, everything that was written against you. What does that mean? Every time you do, every time you are done, every time since you were born, you did something wrong, you said something wrong, there is an invisible policeman. That is uh, following after you. And it's recording you know, everything. It's in the intelligence. And he knows everything you have done. He knows everything you have thought. And everything was written against you. And they were waiting for you that you will soon come over. What does that mean? You will soon die. And when you come over, when you get over there, they open the books. And then they say, look at what you said. Look at what you did. Look at the people you hurt. And look at the people you destroyed. And look at this. And look at this. What have you got to say? Your sin will silence you. But Jesus Christ didn't want you to do that. He didn't want you to get to the other side. And then your sin will silence you. So he went to the cross for you. And everything that you had done, everything reaching against you, he nailed that to the cross. He carried it to the grave. And when he rose up, he left it there. It will never come up again. But you see, you must accept that. You must believe that. And it is when you believe that, it says in verse 15, and having spoiled principalities and powers, principalities and powers. You understand what that means? The principles of the powers that oppress people. And they're supervising everything, and they, they manage everything very well. They make sure that as principal, principalities, and as the powers of darkness, they make sure that anybody on this face of the earth will not go scot-free. But Jesus said, you will be free. Yeah. Am I talking to somebody there tonight? You will be free. As you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, he spoiled, he destroyed, he paralyzed, he made impotent all the principalities and the powers. And then he says, he made a show of them Openly triumphing over them in it. Now you understand why he went to the cross. Now I'm going to pick up that word crucified. Because we're told they crucified him. He was crucified on the cross. We're coming back to First Corinthians chapter 1. In First Corinthians chapter 1, and I'm reading here from verse 23. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 23. It says, but we preach Christ crucified. That's what we preach. You know why we preach Christ crucified? Because it is that crucifixion that will bring you salvation, that will bring you forgiveness, that will bring a change in your life. It is that crucifixion that will bring reconciliation with God. And it says, we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block. But and unto the Greeks foolishness, but unto them which are called, thank God he has called me. I say thank God he has called me. Has he called you? As you respond to that call and you look at Jesus Christ who took your place on the cross of Calvary, thank God salvation is yours today. Forgiveness is yours today. And your name will be written in the book of life in heaven in Jesus' name. It says, we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews, his stumbling block, unto the Greeks, foolishness, but unto them which are called both Jews and Greeks. Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Look at verse 30. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus who of God is made unto us wisdom? You are going to have more wisdom today. Yeah. Righteousness, you have righteousness today. Yeah. And sanctification, sanctification is yours today. Yeah. And redemption. That's the purpose, that's the purpose. And that's the provision that he made for us on the cross of Calvary. Now in Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2, remember what we're looking at now? crucified. We have looked at him on the cross. Now we're looking at him crucified and it says something here. It says that we have a part in that crucifixion. Look at it. In Galatians chapter 2 verse 20, I am crucified with Christ. You know Paul the apostle here, he could have said we are crucified with Christ but he said I'm going to tell you that personally 
It is not my being an apostle that is going to get me to heaven. It is the personal faith I have in the Lord Jesus Christ and I accept that he did it for me and I am crucified with Christ. You know, it is not your position. It's not like I'm a bishop. It's not like I'm a great man. It's not like I'm a great important woman. That's, that was, that's good, that's good. But that doesn't get you to heaven. It is this personal faith in Christ to say, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. Because he died for you, now he's going to share his life with you. And he says, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the face of the Son of God who loved me and he gave himself for me. The reason why he died for you, the reason why he was crucified is because he loved you and he gave himself for you. What's the implication of that for your own life? Look at Galatians chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 24. Galatians chapter 5, verse 24, And they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with their affections and laws. The flesh, you know, the flesh will give us problems. The affections and the laws and the bad things and the dirty things. But now it says those things are crucified with Christ. And so you are free. I said you are free. Uh, I want you to understand this. It's like, you know, somebody has been roaming about, uh, you know, the street terrorizing everybody, and he comes to knock at your door. He comes to knock at your window, and he comes to terrorize you. And your life is not uh, having any peace because of this one that is going about. And the names of these people going about, one is lost and evil affection evil affection will knock at your door laws will knock at your door affections will knock at your door but one day these two people that are roaming about and raging in the community they are nailed to the cross will they trouble you anymore no the affection the evil affection that could have troubled you is now nailed to the cross. And the laws that could have troubled you and pulled you down to the grave and pulled you down to hell is nailed to the cross. Thank God tonight you are free. Look at Galatians chapter 6. I'm reading from verse 14. It says, but God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by whom the world is crucified unto me. It says even the world, all the problems of the world, all the pollutions of the world, and the things that will normally trouble me and pull me back, it says the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. Your problems are over. The uh, powerlessness in your life is over tonight. Now in Romans chapter 6, Romans chapter 6, and I'm reading from verse 6. Romans chapter 6, verse 6, it says, knowing this, somebody must tell you, that's what I'm telling you tonight. If you are not told, how will you know? How would you know if somebody did not read it to you from the Bible? How will you know if somebody did not explain to you? But today you know. You know about Christ's crucifixion for you. And you know about his death for you. And you know about the victory that you are going to have. You know. I know. I said I know. You know, it is what you know that will put you over. It is what you know that will give you the victory. The people who are ignorant, they are in bondage. Those who are ignorant, they are in bondage because they don't know about Christ. They don't know about crucifixion. They don't know about the cross. They don't know the purpose why. They don't know the reason why. But thank God I know. Look at verse 6. It says, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him. That's what you need to know tonight. That the old man that used to give you trouble, the things you didn't want to do, you will do. Because of the power and the pull of that old man. But then it says that old man, you couldn't overcome, you couldn't overpower, and you couldn't in any way subdue that old man. Thank God tonight, you know that that old man is crucified with Christ. It says, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed. Isn't that wonderful? The body of sin, the nucleus of sin, the very root of sin, and the thing that produces sin, that thing will be destroyed. That henceforth, we should not serve sin. Henceforth, we should not serve sin. 
I am free. You are free in Jesus' name. Tonight, as I said, we're looking at the passage in John chapter 19. John chapter 19, the purpose and the provision of Christ's crucifixion. As I look at the passage, this long passage, I'm going to divide the passage to three parts. Number one, accomplishment. Accomplishment. You want to see what Jesus accomplished on the cross. Number two, atonement. Atonement. Atonement means somebody has been an offender and then is guilty, is going to be judged, and then somebody appeased the one that is offended. And the what you use in appeasing that one so that the anger, the judgment, the punishment, the suffering will be taken away is called atonement. Number two, atonement. Number three, acknowledgement. Acknowledgement. That is now we know and it is acknowledged. It's acknowledged by heaven. It's acknowledged on earth and it's acknowledged in your heart. Number one, accomplishment of all scriptures fulfilled. Accomplishment of all scriptures fulfilled. You're going to find in this passage that we're looking at, it says it's fulfilled, that it may be fulfilled. Accomplishment of all scriptures fulfilled. Number two, atonement for all our sins finished. Atonement for all our sins finished. When you finish something, you know, you don't uh, come back there again and say you are working. It's like when you've given a project to a builder and the builder has finished the building, he has handed over the key and then he comes back and he's knocking at the door Say, "What? Well, but you have finished. If you have finished and you have handed over the key, you're not coming back again. And Jesus said, it is finished. All your sins are finished. Punishment, everything finished. Everything taken away. It says it is finished. That's atonement for all our sins. Finished. Number three, acknowledgement of the Savior foretold. Acknowledgement of the Savior foretold. We're coming to point number one now. Tell me number one on that side there. Accomplishment of all scriptures fulfilled. I'm coming to John chapter 19 and i'm reading from verse 23 look at this it says then the soldiers when they had crucified jesus took his garments and they made four parts uh, to every soldier a part and also his coat now the coat was without seam woven from the top throughout and they said therefore among themselves let us not rend it let us not tear it and but cast lots for it, whose uh, whose it shall be, and th that the scripture might be fulfilled. That's the word which says, "They parted my raiment among them, and uh, for my vesture did they cast lots." And these things, therefore, the soldiers did. And then he goes on now to talk about Mary the mother been there and then Mary Magdalene and Jesus in verse 26 therefore saw his mother and the disciples standing by a whom he loved and he says unto his mother woman behold thy son then says he to the disciple behold thy mother and then from that hour the disciple took her took her unto his own home and then he goes on to say in verse 28 it says after this jesus now knowing that all things are were now tell me the word there accomplish that the scriptures might be tell me fulfilled it says i thirst and then he goes on you know those two words you'll find there number one accomplish Number two, fulfill. That's why I will say point number one is accomplishment of all scriptures fulfilled. By the way, what does that mean? All the scriptures accomplished now and fulfilled. I'm going to go right back to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. And we're reading here from verse 15. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman. This is God talking. And this is God saying that he was going to put enmity between Satan 
and the woman, between the serpent and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. And then he goes on to say, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise is healed. The seed of the woman is Jesus Christ. That's the one that came through Virgin Mary without any intercourse with a man. And God said, I'm going to put enmity between you and the seed of the woman. He will bruise your head and thou shalt bruise his heel. Bruise his heel, that is nail the heel to the cross. That's crucifixion. And you see here, these had been written and these had been said way back in Genesis and yet it was now accomplished it was now fulfilled and so you know the life of Jesus Christ was not an accident everything that happened to him had been prophesied it became accomplished look at Zechariah Zechariah that's near the end of the Old Testament now Zechariah chapter 13 I'm reading from verse 7 Zechariah chapter 13 verse 7 it says awake O sword against my shepherd. And remember the name of Je the title of Jesus, I'm the good shepherd. And he says, Now awake, O sword, against my shepherd, against the man that is my fellow. Remember, Jesus said, I and my father are one. And this is referring to Jesus. He says, Says the Lord of hosts, smite the shepherd, and the sheep shall be scattered, and I will turn my hand upon the little ones. Again, this was fulfilled and accomplished when Jesus died on the cross of Calvary. Look at Zechariah chapter 11. Zechariah chapter 11. I'm reading from verse 12. Zechariah 11. Reading from verse 12. And I said unto them, If ye think good, give me my prize. And if not, forbear. So, the wage for my prize, tell me there, 30 pieces of silver. Do you remember how much money Judas has collected in betraying Jesus Christ? Do you remember how much it was? 30 pieces of silver. It had been prophesied. And so you see Jesus Christ, he accomplished what was reaching and it was fulfilled. It says in verse 13, and the Lord said unto me, cast it unto the potter and a goodly price that I was priced at of them, and I took the thirty pieces of silver and cast them to the porter in the house of the Lord. That's exactly what happened later when Judas came back and said, I betrayed the innocent blood. And he said, what's that to us? And then he cast it down and he took it and they did exactly what had been prophesied here. I'm going to show you something now in Psalm 22. Psalm 22, something that was written uh, more than a thousand years before Jesus even came to this world. And look at this. Remember, we're talking about accomplishment of all the scriptures fulfilled by Jesus Christ. Look at this in uh, Psalm 22, verse 1. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Do you remember who said that? Jesus Christ on the cross, he fulfilled that. And so you see all the scriptures were written concerning him. I'm reading from chapter, that chapter 22 of the Psalms. And I'm looking at uh, verse 16. It says, for the dogs have compassed me. The assembly of wicked men uh, enclosed me. They pierced my hand and my feet. That's crucifixion. That's exactly what he did against the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at verse 18 here. They patch my garments among them and cast lost upon my vesture. And so he accomplished and fulfilled all those scriptures that were written concerning him. And uh, when he said, I thirst, do you remember what they gave him to drink when he said, I thirst, I thirst? Anybody remember what they gave him to drink? They gave him gold, they gave him a vinegar. Look at Psalm 69. 
Psalm 69, and I'm reading from verse 21. It makes it to understand the Bible is the word of God. Look at these things that were reaching, reaching concerning Jesus Christ more than a thousand years before he came. And when he came, he accomplished, he fulfilled. Don't forget those two words, he accomplished and he fulfilled. That's the reason why everything he has done for you is going to accomplish. Everything he has done on your behalf is going to fulfill in Jesus' name. Psalm 69, reading from verse 21. They gave me also gall for my meat, and in my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. He fulfilled that. And now we come to Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah chapter 53. And we're reading from verse 10. I see chapter 53, verse 10. It says, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, all that he did was a sacrifice, an offering for your sin, an offering for the sins of the whole world. He shall see his seed. And it shall prolong its days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hands. Uh, you know, th that verse is talking about one of the days of Jesus. Of the days of Jesus. And then after that, because he talks about the offering for sin. The sacrifice for sin. And all that he gave, so that he'll take your sins away. That's why John said, Behold the Lamb of God. That taketh the sin of the world away. And in making that offering, he giving that sacrifice, he took all your sins away. But then he says, the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. That's talking about after his resurrection. That verse then talks about his death and talks about his resurrection. We're coming to Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24, reading about what he accomplished and what he fulfilled. Luke chapter 24, reading from verse 14. And he said unto them, Now he had died, now he was buried. Now he has risen from the dead, and this was after his resurrection. And now he said unto them, unto his disciples, These are the words which I speak unto you, while I was yet with you, that all things, how many things? All things, if you are there, I said how many things? All things must be, tell me, fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses, and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures and said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behoved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached. In his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And so you understand, he's uh, made the sacrifice. And because he's made that sacrifice, so that your sins can be taken away. And so that your sins can be forgiven. So that you'll have peace with God. He says now, we should declare it and preach it and proclaim it everywhere. From Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the rest of the world. And coming here tonight to proclaim it unto you. And as you believe, all your sins are taken away. As you believe, all your guilt and condemnation, everything will be blotted away in Jesus' name. I come now to Acts of the Apostles chapter 3. Acts of the Apostles chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 17. Now and now, brethren, I know that through ignorance ye did it, as did also your rulers. But those things which God before had showed by the mouth of all his prophets that Christ should suffer, he has so fulfilled. That's the word again. Everything that God had said concerning Jesus Christ, through those prophets of the Old Testament, God has now fulfilled 
What's the response? What are you to do concerning that? And what are you going to do now because of what has been done already by Christ? Look at verse 19. Repent ye therefore. The word therefore means everything is accomplished. Everything is fulfilled. He said he will come. He came. He said he will be betrayed. He was betrayed. He said he will die for you. He died for you. He said he will nail him to the cross. And it has happened just like that. Therefore, seeing that everything has been accomplished and seeing that everything has been fulfilled, repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. When the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord, a new day will start for you. A time of refreshing will happen to you. And then all your sins are gone, all your sins are forgiven, and a new life will come in Jesus' name. Look at verse 26 there. Unto you first, God, having raised up his son, Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you. How many of us? How many are supposed to be saved? How many are supposed to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ? How many can receive forgiveness today? How many can be cleansed from all iniquity today? Look at that verse again. Unto you first God, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you. He will bless you tonight. In turning away every one of you from his iniquities. From his iniquities. You can be free tonight. We're coming to point number two now. Atonement for all our sins finished. Atonement for all our sins finished. You see, he did the work. And then he said, it is finished. Let me remind you, in John chapter 19, verse 30. John chapter 19, verse 30. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, somebody shout it out. For yourself, for your conviction, you know that this is true. Say it out aloud. It is finished. Judgment finished. Oppression finished. Suffering finished. Suffering in hell finished. You will not go to hell. You will not perish. Because Jesus said, it is finished and he bowed the sedge and gave up the ghost the question is what did he mean by that it is finished he meant that the atonement has now been finalized finalized finished it is not to be done again atonement look at it in leviticus chapter 17 leviticus chapter 17 I'm reading from verse 11. Here is what Jesus referred to. And here is what Jesus did. And he did it on your behalf. You look at this in Leviticus chapter 17 verse 11. For the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. To make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. It is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. Why? Because you understand, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. Because of your sin, the death penalty has been upon you. And there is nothing that can take that away. If you come to offer, let's say you know that we're building the church and you come to offer some blocks. That's good, that's good. Because without those blocks, we cannot have the church building. But you know the, the block does not have blood. And it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. Or maybe you know that, uh, you know, we are doing something here and say, I bring money. That's good because uh, money will help us to buy this, buy that. And money will help us to carry on a lot of the ministry. But you know, the money does not have blood. And it is when I see the blood, what will happen? 
I will pass over you. It is when I see the blood, I know that somebody or something you know, has been killed on your behalf, has been destroyed on your behalf, and Jesus Christ came to fulfill that. And it is the blood of Jesus Christ that makes that atonement. Do you remember, you've heard about the story of Cain and Abel, and some people were wondering, how is it Cain brought of the fruit of the ground? And it wasn't that, you know, they were bad, bad fruit or whatever. It was good. But, you know, that fruit was coming from the ground. And that fruit had been cursed because the ground had been cursed. And the fruit did not have any blood. And God said, Cain, if you had done well, you would have been forgiven. If you have not done well, the sin offering is still there. That has blood that will be your substitute. Go and take it and offer. But no, he wouldn't do that. And he perished. But in the case of Abel, he took a lamb. And because that one had blood, that's the reason why Abel was forgiven and saved. Abel is now in heaven. When you leave this world, if you have made Jesus Christ your Savior, and to be the atonement for your sin, you'll see Abel in heaven. Well, you don't know Abel, but you know me. You will see me in heaven. I will see you in heaven because it is the blood that makes the atonement. And let me show you something here now. Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26. And see what Jesus Christ himself said concerning you know, the blood of atonement. He tells us in Matthew chapter 26 verse 28. He says, for this is my blood of the new testament which is shed for many for the remission of sins there we are again the sin that is going to grant us favor with god that will appease him that will take the anger of god away from us is the blood that jesus shed for you for me for us and for everyone and I pray that tonight you'll make that blood avail for you as you believe in Jesus' name. How do you believe? You'll say, Jesus died for me. The blood of Jesus will cleanse me. And the blood of Jesus will take all my sins away. It will happen tonight. Romans chapter 3. In Romans chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And what does, why are we reading that? Is to remind you that nobody can say, I'm all right. I'm like an angel. No, you are not. I'm all right. I don't have any guilt. No, you are not, you are not right. You have guilt. All the world has become guilty in the sight of God. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. If you think back, if you look at your life, since you were young, the things you said that you said, why did I say that? I shouldn't have said that. The things you did, and then you thought, why did I do that? I shouldn't have do, done that. And the things that brought guilt and condemnation to your heart, that's why it says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now, there are people that will not point at themselves that they are sinners. They are pointing to other people. But you understand? While they are pointing to other people, other people are pointing to them. And so, we point to you, you point to us, we point to each other, everyone has seen. And what can take our sins away? Look at it now, verse 24. It says, being justified freely. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth as the propitiation. That's another word. It's a big word there. It just means the cleansing of your sin and the covering of your sin. And it says through faith in his blood. Very important. It is through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission, removal, cleansing, or forgiveness of the sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. It says in verse 26 to declare, I say, at this time is righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of him that believeth in him, in Jesus. I believe tonight. You believe tonight, your sins are forgiven. Give me a good amen. 
Romans, what are you looking at? Romans chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 6. Romans chapter 5, verse 6. It says, for when or yet without strength, you see that? I said that earlier, we don't have any strength against Satan. Any strength against sin. Any strength against evil spirits and evil powers, principalities and powers. We don't have any strength against the suffering, you know, and we don't have anything we're going to give to escape the judgment of God. But it says, when we're yet without strength, in due time, what happened? Christ died for the ungodly. It says, for scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us. I'm going to read that again. This is for me now. But God commendeth his love toward me. But God commendeth his love toward toward you, toward me, toward us in that while we were yet sinners, what happened? Christ died for us. Who did he die for? He died for you. As you accept that tonight, a change will happen. God will take away your name from the book of condemnation. He'll bring your name to the book of life. You have the joy of salvation, the peace and the rest of mind. Look at it, it goes on in verse 9. Much more than being now justified by his blood. Justified by his blood. Not by our good works, not by the money we give to beggars, not by any good deed we have done. We're justified by his blood. We shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. This verse 11 is important. Listen, and not only so, but we also joy, we rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ by whom we have received the atonement by whom we have received the atonement, the atonement for all our sins finished. It is finished. Amen. Hebrews chapter 9. In Hebrews chapter 9, here I'm reading from verse 22. Hebrews chapter 9. And we're reading from verse 22. Tells us something about the centrality of the blood. And the importance of the blood, this is not just any blood, the blood of Jesus. It says in Hebrews chapter 9 verse 22, it says, And almost all things are by the Lord purged with blood. And without the shedding of blood is no remission. Without the crucifixion of Christ, without the death of Christ, and without the blood of Jesus Christ, that spotless blood, blameless blood, pure blood, perfect blood, without that shedding of blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, is no removal of sin, is no forgiveness. But now, thank God, we have forgiveness. I have forgiveness. I have redemption. I have salvation through the blood of Jesus Christ. In 1 Peter chapter 1, 1 Peter chapter 1, reading from verse 18, For as much as she know, I pray you will know this from the death of your heart. You'll know without any shaking, without any doubt, you'll know that you know that this one thing is true concerning you. For as much as she know that she, Ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, as silver and gold. You're not coming before God and you're not saying, Lord, you know how much money I've been giving to you? How, many, how much money I've been giving to the church, silver and gold? You know how much I contributed? You know how much I gave? You know that we're not redeemed with silver or with gold. And then it goes on from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers. Look at this, look at this, verse 19. But with the precious blood of who? 
of Christ. But for the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. That's how we're saved. That's how we're redeemed. And that's how the peace of God comes to us. It will be yours tonight. Yeah. Through that blood we're saved. Do you know through that blood we're sanctified? Look at chapter 10 of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 10. I read from verse 10. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 10. For it says, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. It's done it once for all. It will not be done again. It's done it for you and it is finished. Somebody help me shout, it is finished. Look at verse 14. For by one offering, he has perfected forever them that are sanctified. You have been saved. He will sanctify you too. And it is through the blood of the Lamb. Look at Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13. We're reading from verse 20 and verse 21. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 20. Now the God of peace. He'll give you peace. That brought again from the dead and not Jesus that great shepherd of the sheep. Through the blood, you see that? It's through the blood of the everlasting covenant. Make you perfect. In every good work. To do his will. Walking in you. That which is well pleasing in his sight. Through Jesus Christ. To whom be glory forever and ever. Yeah. Amen. And then we come to Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1. Atonement for all our sins finished. Finished. Revelation chapter 1 verse 5. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us, and washed us from our sins in his own blood. And made us kings and priests unto God and his father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Amen. It says he has washed us from all our sins. And he did that through faith in his blood. And when he washes us like that, he doesn't just leave us on the ground level. He promotes us and lifts us up. And now we're going to reign with him. Amen. I said, I'm going to reign with him. Amen. And while you're still here on earth, you reign over every problem in Jesus' name. Amen. You reign over every affliction in Jesus' name. Amen. Because of the blood of Jesus and because of that blood is shed for you, which you believe. And you say, yes, I'm holding on by faith to that blood. Everything that had dominion over your life before, you will have dominion from now on in Jesus' name. Victory will be yours. Triumph will be yours. And the power to overcome every challenge of life will be yours in Jesus' name. In fact, it tells us in Revelation chapter 12, I'm reading here from verse 9. Revelation chapter 12, reading from verse 9. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceives the whole world because you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And because you believe the blood of atonement that is shed for you, that old serpent will be under your feet. Satan will be under your feet and the power of the devil under your feet in Jesus name and it says he deceiveth the whole world he will not get you to deceive he was cast out into the earth and his angels cast out with him look at verse 11 and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and tonight I overcome tonight you overcome 
we overcome him by the blood of the lamb and it says and by the word of their testimony and they loved not their lives even unto the death it says we have the victory and thank god you have the victory we're looking at first john chapter 1 verse 7 first john chapter 1 reading from verse 7 here it tells us in uh, chapter 1 of first john reading from verse 7 it says but if we walk in the light what does that mean the light of the scripture we're receiving the light of the teaching we're receiving the light the light that is shown to us now that jesus christ was on the cross for you and jesus christ was crucified for you you are enlightened and then you go with that light of scripture and you are walking in that light and you believe that word and you accept that word and say this is for me if we walk in the light as he is in the light as he is in the light not sometimes in the light and sometimes in darkness not sometimes uh, believing in the lord jesus christ and then going back to believe in idols not sometimes believing the word of god your word is a lamp unto my feet a light that shines across my way and then going back to the rituals and going back to tradition and superstition which is darkness not that you are in and out in and out but you are walking in the light as he is in the light always in the light forever in the light consistently in the light in the day in the night anywhere you find yourself you're walking in the light it says we have fellowship with one another look at this and the blood of jesus christ his son what does he do cleanseth us from how many sins all sin the blood will do that the blood of jesus will do that and when he cleanses us then we're free when he cleanses us then we have peace of mind when he cleanses us we have rest in our souls it will be yours in jesus name it is finished i said it is finished say it for yourself it is finished look at this daniel chapter 9 i'm reading from verse 24 daniel chapter 9 i'm reading from verse 24 it says in verse 24 look at this 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon the holy city here is daniel daniel was looking ahead before christ came and he said this is the timetable of god and it says 77s that's actually what it means in reaching out 77s are determined upon thy people and upon the holy city are you there in daniel chapter 9 verse 24 tell me the word that follows there tell me out loud if you're sure say it like other people are saying it to finish the transgression you see that daniel looked ahead he said somebody is coming it's called the son of man somebody is coming is a very son of god and when he comes and then he gives the timetable as to when he will come he said he will finish transgression in your life he will finish transgression in your family he'll finish transgression in all the members of the church he'll finish the transgression that transgression will not be your problem anymore. You will not be rising and falling, rising and falling because he has come and he said it is finished and he will finish all the transgression. Look at this. And to make an end of sins. And to make an end of sins. You come to Christ and then the sins you could not overcome by yourself, it will overcome on your behalf. And then it goes on to say, to make reconciliation for iniquity. It brings us to God and makes reconciliation for us. And it says, to bring in what kind of righteousness? Everlasting righteousness. That's what Christ has come to do. That's why Jesus said, it is finished and then it says and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy as the lord has done it already by sacrifice on the cross of calvary he will accomplish it in your life in jesus name we're coming now to point number three and we're looking at acknowledgement of the savior foretold acknowledgement of the savior foretold we're coming to john chapter 19 
I'm reading from verse 38. Reading from verse 38, and after this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, besought Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him leave, and he came therefore and took the body of Jesus. And there came also Nicodemus, which at the first came to Jesus by night and brought a mixture of mire and uh, aloes and uh, about a hundred pounds weight. And, it, and then took day the body of Jesus and wound it in linen clothes with the spices as the manner of the Jews is to bury. Now the place where he was crucified there was a garden, and in the garden, a new sepulchre, that's a tomb, where Rina was never man laid. And they laid, they laid Jesus, therefore, because of the Jews' preparation day for the sepulchre was nice at hand. You understand, Joseph of Arimathea, he was a rich man. And then uh, Nicodemus was also a popular person among the Jews. They came for the body of Jesus Christ so that they can bury that body. What were they doing? They were making acknowledgement of the fact that this is the Savior. Look at Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah chapter 53, and you'll see what they did was acknowledgement. They acknowledge. It says in Isaiah chapter 53 verse 9, Isaiah chapter 53 verse 9, he made his grave with the wicked. That is, you see those people that were nailed to the cross beside him. One on this side, the other on that side. Even one of them said, we're suffering for our sin. But he has done nothing wrong. And so he died with those wicked people and for the wicked people. And so it says he made his grave with the wicked. And with the rich in his death. And with the rich, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus. And remember, when Isaiah wrote this in chapter 53... Jesus that was not even born at that time. He was prophesying that when he comes, there will be an acknowledgement by the poor, by the rich, by the sinners, and by everyone. And then it says, when thou, in verse, in verse 9 there, and with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him he has put him to grieve the suffering for you, for me, for us. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, and he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the travail of his soul, verse 11, and shall be satisfied by his knowledge, shall my righteous servant justify many are you a part of that many yeah. he saves many are you a part yeah. he has forgiven many people are you a part of that yeah. if you have not taken part tonight it's your chance yeah. it says for he shall bear the iniquities therefore will i divide him a portion of the great and he shall divide the spoil with the strong because he has poured out his soul unto death and he was numbered with the transgressors and he bare the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors what has that to do with you and with me that the savior was foretold and now there is acknowledgement of the fact that he is savior we're reading from psalm 51 psalm 51 this is what you have to do so that you too, you will acknowledge. So that you too, you will identify with the Lord Jesus Christ. And you will say, he died for me. He took my sins away. And I acknowledge that. I believe that. And I affirm that. Psalm 51 verse 1. Have mercy upon me, O God. According to thy loving kindness. According to the multitude of thy tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. That's what you will do. 
He'll blot out your transgression. You'll not have any remembrance of them anymore in Jesus' name. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my sin, my transgression, and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee only, have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest, and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Look at the king, he was, uh, you know, the number one in that nation of Israel at that time. And yet he said, I'm not going to pretend all I've seen and come short of the glory of God. And I know I've seen. And he confessed before the Lord. And then he said, look at verse 7. Purge me with Aesop and I shall be clean. Purge me, purge me, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins, and blot out how many of my iniquities? All my iniquities. Verse 10, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. He will do it. I said they will do it. Uh, look, at, look at verse 12. Restore to me the joy of thy salvation. Restore to me the joy of thy salvation. And uphold me with thy free spirit. Your time has come. Psalm 103. Psalm 103. I'm reading here from verse 12. Psalm 103, we're reading from verse 12. Because Jesus died for you, died for us, this is what is going to happen. Psalm 103, verse 12, as far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. Amen. Amen. When he says, as far as the east is from the west, he's talking about the far horizon where the sun rises and then that's far from where the sun sets as they are far apart and somebody in the east where the sun rises will not see the person in the west where the sun sets he says that way have you removed our sins from us you remove all your sins from you that way they will not come near you anymore in Jesus' name. Psalm 130, Psalm 130, and I'm reading here from verse 8. Psalm 130, verse 8. Very important. I'm waiting for you to open the Bible. Psalm 130, verse 8. Are you there now? Okay, read it for me. One, two, three, go. And ye shall redeem all Israel from how many iniquities? All his iniquities. He's talking about you today. Amen. Isaiah chapter 45. Isaiah chapter 45. Isaiah chapter 45. And we're looking at verse 22. Isaiah chapter 45. Reading from verse 22. It says, look unto me and be ye saved all the ends of the earth for i am god and there is none else look unto me and be ye saved all the ends of the earth you know there are some people because they do not know and because they have not read all these that were reading the bible tonight they say that that salvation is for the white people uh -uh. look at this look unto me and be ye saved what follows there all the ends of the earth, all the ends of the earth, salvation is for everyone all over the earth. And thank God tonight, it is yours. Amen. Psalm 61, Psalm 61, and I'm reading from verse 10. Psalm 61, reading from verse 10. See what it will do. In verse 10, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he has closed me with the garment of salvation. That's what he does when you come to the Lord and say, Lord, I need your salvation. He says, he has closed me with the garment of salvation and then with the robe of righteousness. Tonight, you have it. 
Psalm 60, uh, Isaiah chapter 63. Isaiah chapter 63 is the confirmation, the acknowledgement of the Savior that was foretold. Isaiah chapter 63 verse 1. Who is this that cometh from Edom with dyed garments from Bosra? This that is glorious in his appearance, traveling in the greatness of his train. He answers, I that speak in righteousness, tell me, mighty to save, mighty to save. No matter how far you've gone in sin, and no matter how deep you have been in sin, Jesus tonight, is, it was foretold. This was written concerning him, and it says, it's mighty to save. Verse 8, for he said, surely they are my people. I'm one of them. Surely they are my people. I said I'm one of them. Children that will not lie. So he was their savior. Tonight, he is our savior. He is my savior. I said he is my savior. As you believe, so it is in Jesus' name. Jeremiah chapter 23, acknowledgement of the Savior foretold. It tells us in Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 6, In his days Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely. This is his name, whereby he shall be called the Lord our righteousness. Say that, the Lord our righteousness. He'll be your righteousness in Jesus' name. It was foretold now because he has finished it, it is going to be fulfilled in your life. Jeremiah 31. Jeremiah chapter 31. Reading from verse 33. Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 33. But they shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, look at this. I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts. I will be their God and they shall be my people. People of God, are they there tonight? Yeah. Oh, he'll be your God. He'll be your savior. He'll be your redeemer. All your sins, he'll take away in Jesus' name. Ezekiel chapter 36, acknowledgement of the Savior foretold. It was foretold, and now it's fulfilled, and now it's finished. In Ezekiel chapter 36, look at what he said he will do. When he has made the offering, and when he says it is finished, look at what he has accomplished when he said it's finished. In Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 25, then will I sprinkle clean water upon you. And ye shall be clean. You'll be clean. Your mind will be clean. Your life will be clean. He says, I will sprinkle clean water upon you. And ye shall be clean from all your filthiness. And from all your idols will I cleanse you. That's number one. Somebody say number one. That's salvation. Look at number two now. Verse, 30, verse 26. A new heart also will I give you. And a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh. And I will give you an heart of flesh. That's number two. Somebody say number two. And the second work of grace. That's sanctification. It takes away the stony heart and it gives us the heart of flesh. We're going to number three now. Look at verse 27. And I will put my spirit within you. The Holy Ghost will come within you. The Holy Ghost will come upon you. The Holy Ghost will overshadow you. The Holy Ghost will indwell you. That's number three. Baptism in the Holy Ghost. And I will put my spirit within you. And cause you to walk in my statutes. And you shall keep my judgments and do them. It was prophesied. And now it is going to be fulfilled. It will be fulfilled in your life. In Jesus name. The time of fulfillment has come. Amen. Your own time of fulfillment has come. Amen. Look at Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13. 
I'm reading here from verse 22. Somebody help me shout the word fulfillment. fulfillment. That's not the whole house. Fulfillment. fulfillment. It will be fulfilled in your life in Jesus' name. Now we're coming to Acts chapter 13, verse 22. And when he had removed him, he removed Saul, you will not be removed. He raised up unto them David to be their king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, he will find you tonight. The son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, which shall fulfill all my will of this man's seed, as God, according to his promise, raised unto, unto Israel a Savior. What's his name? Jesus. Jesus. Verse 38. In verse 38, he said, Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sin and by him, Jesus Christ, all that believe are justified all in all from all things from which ye could not be justified by the law of Moses. Now justification has come. Salvation has come. Redemption has come. Verse 46 then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God shall first have been spoken to you. But, this is serious, but, there's a tragedy here, but seeing ye put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, Lo, we turn to the Gentiles. There are people that reject the free gift of God. I will not reject. And because they reject, Paul and Barnabas told them, okay, you should have got it. It should have been yours. A place should have been for you in heaven. But because you reject and push it away from you, now we go to the Gentiles. For so, as the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee for, to be a light, of the Gentiles, that thou shouldest be for the salvation to the ends of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad, like you are glad tonight, like you are happy tonight, that salvation is yours, and they glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as were ordained unto eternal life believed, as many as wanted eternal life and they were ordained for eternal life and they were assigned for eternal life and they were chosen for eternal life, they believed. I believe tonight. I said I believe tonight. Eternal life is yours. Whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And whosoever comes to Christ tonight, he will not cast you away. You are coming. I said you are coming. Where are you? I'm coming to Christ tonight. I'm coming. I'm coming. I am coming. Right? So up and tell the Lord, Lord, I come. Lord, I come. And I know that already you have accomplished it. It's fulfilled. Already there's atonement. And I know it is finished. Already there's acknowledgement. It had been foretold. And it is mine tonight. It is mine tonight. It is mine tonight. Just say, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I cannot save myself. I know I've gone astray. But Jesus Jesus Christ came to die for me and because he came to die for me I receive him now as my savior I receive him now as my lord call upon him call upon him say lord I'm sorry for any bad thing every bad thing I've done I'm sorry for my waywardness I'm sorry for my iniquity I'm sorry for my sin but now I come I see you on the cross and I see that you've died for me and I see that now you have replaced me there and you are my substitute lord I believe lord I believe lord I believe and forgiveness is yours Salvation is yours. Righteousness is yours. Deliverance is yours. It sets you free tonight. Call upon the name of the Lord. Your redemption is here.